I'll start introducing myself to uh, the centre and um, the end of it. Uh, I'll come back to you finally in the flash. Right, um, if you want to use a mic, there are some. Okay, okay. okay. Uh, I'm a cryptozoologist. Um, I'm one of only four no, cryptozoologists in the country. I'm one of only four cryptozoologists, that is, uh, people who make it in lots of ways and they make it doing what I do for the science. I know uh, fully in a full four, the claim that they make that they've been in full time all in England. So I'd better explain what cryptozoologists do.
can you come out to Thailand in about four days' time? <laughs> so, uh, so basically I said, is the boat Catholic? Mm. So I found myself, all of a sudden, from the unpleasant climate of Exeter in October, uh, to being in Bangkok. Now I better explain before I, I go into the narrative as actually what Naga is. Naga is a giant snake. It comes from originally Hindu and then Buddhist mythology. They're supposed to be um, sacred magical creatures, of, creatures of immense size. And uh, they bore a strange crest on their head, rather like a, a cockatoo's crest, but made out of scales. And uh, rather like a cobra opens its hood and it's angry, the Naga would raise its crest. And according to Buddhist scriptures, it can kill in three ways, sorry, four ways. It can spit poison, it can bite poison, bite you and inject poison. It can whip its coils around you and crush you, and rather like a constricting snake like that. It was also said to be able to slay people just by staring at them, rather like a basilisk in uh, Middle Eastern and European legend. And the, actually, the word Naga in, in uh, Hindi means to see or to be sharp eyed. Now, uh, in Thailand, the religion is a very strange sort of mishmash between Hinduism and Buddhism. Uh, they're supposed to be Buddhists and they have Buddhist temples, but all of them are adorned with Naga statues. And they also they have, they have Buddhist monks, like in the Buddhist countries, but also they've incorporated a lot of Hindu deities into their pantheon. So you see statues of um, Kali, the Hindu goddess of destruction, with all the arms. You might remember her probably from the Sinbad film, where the statue comes to life and fights Sinbad. Uh, Ganesh, the elephant god, Hanuman, Monkey God. And uh, they've all been incorporated into this particularly strange brand of Buddhism. And uh, the Naga from originally from Hindu mythology have been incorporated too. But uh, unfortunately the Naga, or fortunately, the Naga seems to be unsatisfied with just being a legend because people still report seeing these gigantic snakes in the primal morasses. Of Indochina today, and particularly in the Mekong River, which runs all the way down from China, past Burma, through Cambodia, Thailand, Laos, and finally out into the uh, Pacific Ocean. So, for a start off, we were in Bangkok, um, which looks disturbingly like Birmingham. So, I remember on my first night, looking out for my hotel room, thinking, crikey, this looks like Birmingham. <laughs> I've been to Birmingham and they've got this building called the Rotunda, which looks like a huge coke can. It's an office block, but it's uh, cylindrical. And they've got a thing there that looks exactly the same. And they, unlike Birmingham, you'll be walking down the street in Bangkok and you suddenly come across an elephant going through the bins. <laughs> and no one bats an eyelid. Anyway, one of the things they wanted to do when they were in and around Bangkok, um, I'd suggested to them that it was possible that they, the things that people were seeing swimming in the Incom River in the big reptilian animals were outsized Indo-Pacific crocodiles. The Indo-Pacific crocodile, also known as the saltwater restaurant crocodile, is the biggest known reptile in the world. The largest one measured by a reliable expert was 28 feet long. It was never weighed in the region of three tons. There have been reports of much bigger ones, well over 30 feet. And uh, they kill more people per year than, than big cats, elephants, sharks, and all the other predators put together. They're one of the most dangerous animals in the world. And uh, uh, to put it in strictly scientific and zoological terms, the Indo-Pacific crocodile makes a great white shark look like a soft southern shandy drinker. <laughs> <laughs> it really is an incredibly mean animal. Now, luckily for us, just south of Bangkok, there was a place called the um, Samuel Pakat uh, Crocodile Farm, which was the biggest crocodile farm in the world, wherein they had the biggest captive crocodile anywhere in the world. He was six metres long, which is, you know, there are bigger ones in the wild, but for a captive crocodile, that's pretty big, a pretty big animal. Mm -hmm. And if his head was there near Lara Cross backside, I'd envy him for a start, mm -hmm. and uh, his tail would be oh, waving around, 
middle of that piece of silver. A uh, official representation of his size. And uh, this particular animal was called Yai, which in, in Thai means big. It's an awful lot of thought went into that name. What would you call this crocodile? And it's big and I'm calling it big. No, I wouldn't have a different one. Anyway, <coughs> Yai and several of his, uh, his compadres were a similar size. We were all sitting in this pool together, <coughs> in the water, and uh, we went to film them. And the camera crew said, uh, oh, we've got this bucket full of dead chickens here. What we want you to do is open this gate, lean through, and feed them, and we'll, we'll film you lot from over here. <laughs> <laughs> but I used to be a zookeeper many, many, many moons ago at a dreadful establishment in the Midlands uh, called Wide Cross Two, which is best known for its name. But I remember that got out there, so uh, I'm not that scared of that. Uh, of the reptile, or so. The only animal that really scares me actually are large moths for some reason. I can't stand them. But people think I'm mad. I handle them with snakes and crocs and all sorts of things, but I can't stand them. A big moth comes anywhere near me, I freak out. Anyway, so I thought this cookie full of dead chickens, flinging them through to these crocodiles. The yeah, eye, a very big one, couldn't care less, was bouncing off his head and he was being drawn. The others were snapping on. And, uh, <coughs> The keepers there swore by their sainted mothers that Yai was the biggest crocodile they had in the crocodile farm. But uh, out in the main pool, because there was a huge main pool with several small pools going on, I spotted several that looked considerably bigger. And asking the um, various other keepers of this crocodile farm uh, whereabouts this, the biggest crocodile they had was, nobody seemed to know. I mean, you all have different stories. And there seemed to be one it's at least seven and a half metres or 25 feet long, right out to the very centre of the pool. But so, unfortunately for me, of course, it didn't come any closer. So basically, I, I stood in the cameras and talked a bit about crocodiles and how large they can be, and um, fed the chicken carcasses for a while. Then we really got to the meet. We left Bangkok and went up into the north of Thailand, away from the tourist traps, uh, to. Uh, some very primitive places, but it's mainly villages and rainforests and not much else. Now, in October every year, the Thais and the Laos, Laos is inside this, the Mekong River, celebrate the end of the rainy season in October by something they call the Naga Festival. And it's, uh, this time of year, they believe that the Nala will come to the surface of the Yukon River and breathe out great balls of fire from its jaws and stick them into the sky. And uh, these balls of light are supposed to be shooting down the Yukon River. And we want to go and film it. And I got quite excited about all of this because um, strange balls of light appearing hither and thither. Uh, I know in the world, in, in uh, the west here, we call them Earth lights. They're often associated with uh, ley lines and um, things like that. And there's a researcher called Paul Devereaux who, uh, who believes that uh, they're a sort of um, energy created by fault lines in the Earth. So um, <coughs> I found myself on the banks of the Mekong River surrounded by 100,000 screaming excited ties, shining spotlights on the water, letting off fireworks, shining um, laser points on board, which are not exactly conducive to spotting fireballs. So there we all were, waiting with bated breath. And suddenly, the cheer goes up, and the loads of floats going by, and there's this great parade beforehand with a huge float with a naga on it. All this great shaman, and, um, and well, suddenly this shout goes up, there's the fireballs, there are the fireballs. There's another one, there's another one. Come on. Fair enough. Then you're getting two at once, one and two. You're getting three, one, two, three. And something suddenly occurred to me. Now this section of the Mekong River was about 500 foot wide, and on the other side was Laos. I was on the Thai side. And I thought, hang on, if this is a natural phenomenon, if this is either marsh gas or some strange energy release, it should be happening from the entire width of the river. But it's all happening from the Laotian side. 
And it's all happening from places where I can see lots, i.e. where there's people. And the more I looked at this, the more it looked very, very orchestrated. Rather like a uh, county council fireworks display. <laughs> These balls like one, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, four. And they, they come up to the left and they come up to the right. And it swiftly dawned on me that uh, what I was looking at was in fact either flares or fireworks. Now, do you know those fireworks that don't make much noise? They don't make screaming noise and they don't explode, they just go up and play. I don't really understand the point of them, but they do. It was, it was transparent that this is what was going on. And the tides were all taken in by this. They were saying, the breath of the mark and the fireballs and getting excited, jumping up and down. And it was very, very obvious that this was uh, a man-made, a man-made occurrence. And uh, one of the guys that were there with us was a man called Paul Adorax. He was a very, very clever guy. He was a um, campaign manager for the opposition party in, in Thai politics. And he was also an international best-selling author. He wrote, so he's written several books, uh, The King Kong Effect, um, When the Karma Ends, um, He Kong, uh, sold quite well over here. And this was a clever guy. And he was totally suckered by this as well. He was saying, oh no, they can't be fireworks because make no noise and they don't explode. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, <coughs> there's something called the Loch Ness Hoodoo. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but it's this thing whereby cameras always fail. Whenever the Loch Ness Monster appears, cameras always seem to fail. So they've run out of film or the shutter jams. Well, I, I was here with my, um, my digital camera trying to catch this on the film, you know, just to show what a load of nonsense it was. And earlier in the day, I checked this camera, and it said it had one hour's charge left on it. And unaccountably, it ran out of batteries. Well, there you go. But I, uh, I also interviewed some witnesses to the creature itself while I was up there. Uh, there's a town called Mong Kai. It is. Uh, I talked to an old woman that's supposedly seen the creature about uh, four years ago, and she'd been travelling on a bus. A bus, it was double deck bus, and she'd looked down into Nikon River by a bridge called the Bridge of Friendship, which is supposed to be, which links um, uh, Thailand with Laos. And she saw this immense snake like animal lying motionless um, beneath the bridge, and she described it as being about as thick as a football. That's a proper English football, not a Nazi American football. And about five metres long, jet black. So it was too narrow to be a crocodile. It could have been a big python, I suppose. But she, she was adamant that it was not a python, it was a naga. She was a very clever old lady. She could speak and write fluent English. And she also ran uh, the only cyber cafe in northern Thailand. She ran an anti stamp shop and a cyber cafe. And whenever she went to the cyber cafe, everyone would turn around and say, Call her name, run like Norm, cheer, and she had to tell her name. And then she came to the scene. Also in Nong Kai, there was a Buddhist temple. And uh, about eight years ago, the temple that stood there beforehand uh, was a tumble down, derelict place. We decided it should be torn down with uh, a new temple built. And, uh, Whenever any of the workmen tried to approach this temple to tear bits of it down, an immense black snake would appear to strike at them. And I, I interviewed a, uh, <coughs> a Buddhist abbot, the abbot of the, of the monastery, who looked um, very like Brian Glover, the late Brian Glover, if you remember him, uh, the guy with the voices to Tepa Tepitifa, big Yorkshire and bold. I don't know if you remember him, he passed away now. But he, this, this guy was a Thai version of him. Uh, he was telling me how uh, he and all the, all, all the monks had actually seen this huge black snake coil in a temple. And whenever anybody approached the temple, it would rear up and press the and strike the thing. And eventually they, they had to pacify for an offering. They never, really, they never actually told me what the offering was. They made some sort of an offering, some sort of a religious ceremony, and offered some little snake, and it disappeared in the nest. Anyway, 
from there, we went to another even smaller town called Pompasai. And in Pompasai, there was something that really got me excited. Because supposedly, there are actual real bones of a naga. And I was a zoologist, I thought, great, there's something solid here I'm going to look at. There's something, you know, maybe I'll take it back for DNA analysis, maybe I'll recognise it as part of a jawbone of a giant snake or a vertebrate snake. And uh, these bones were considered holy relics, and there was a very interesting story attached to them. Supposedly, the man who owned them a few years ago had this dream where an Anago appeared to him in his dream and told him he had to cross the bridge to Laos, where all these men had some Anago bones and must purchase these bones. So Jumi, the man, went across the bridge, met another man on the other side who did indeed have Anago bones, but no, he didn't want to sell them. So the man went back to Thailand. And Naga appeared in his dream for a second time and said, go back a second time, ask him if he'll sell half of the bones. So the man obeyed the Naga across the bridge, met the man again, will you sell half the bones and no, I won't. On the third night, the Naga said, try one last time, and this time he will relent. So the man once again crossed the bridge into Laos, talked the ocean man into selling these Naga bones, and he took them somewhere. These Naga bones were brought back on the side in Thailand and uh, had, become, had the status of holy relics. Now, this mysterious fellow, the bones owner, who had this series of dreams, didn't want to be filmed. He didn't want his house to be filmed either. He said, uh, we could fill the bones and touch them, but we weren't allowed to take them away. So they, they were sent to the Homicide Police Station under lock and key. And myself and the crew <coughs> were waiting there with Baker's ring. And they brought in this great chalice about the size of the World Cup, this great silver chalice with a dome lid over it. Put it on the table in the office. They all gathered around and they lifted the lid off to reveal the sacred bones. And I said, that's a bleeding elephant's tooth. <laughs> this supposed <laughs> sacred naga bone was nothing more than a, a mother of an Indian elephant. Now, how in a land that is so crammed band full of elephants, they can't recognise an elephant's tooth, uh, is completely beyond me. So that was another red herring. But the chief of police in Pompasai was a man called Officer Sufat himself, several years earlier, had seen a Naga. And he'd been with a crowd of about 30 people, walking along some cliffs beside the Mekong River. And they noticed something in the water, which at first they thought was a uh, the horizontal flexation side to side, which is very important because uh, mammals, marine mammals, will always swim with vertical flexation, whereas fish and reptiles swim. Well, something out of the Toho Studios Godzilla film. <laughs> we seem very, very uh, genuine. He's an intelligent man. What I think may have happened there is he saw several creatures swimming close behind each other. Now I've seen films with saltwater crocodiles where a female is swimming and males are swimming behind them on top of one big creature. What I think he saw is some strange snake-like animals swimming either in unison, trailing each other along. Or he was in some way that this big animal was making for all the parts of the body. But I think he would see, genuinely see them. And the camera crew uh, crawled down with me and he was picking up that camera. On all fours into no, sorry. a cave or oh, probably mm -hmm. 20 by 20 feet and about 4 feet tall. Mm -hmm. I was thinking it was obviously very impressive. I can't see a large animal being in here. What are we doing? It's up. Mr. Pippa beckoned right in the corner. There was a little triangular opening in the rock. So we could walk to the The camera people can follow. You can get the camera down there. So I followed him down on foot. 
crouching down like this. That's a wolf about 40 feet. Okay. Maybe I'll talk to my chest. Out into all of the cave. <laughs> all in the pitch black and light. Okay. Well, then let me put another little cave. Another little cave. And the whole area was like a monitor labyrinth. If the monitor had been a hobbit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I went for about a mile underground, often crawling on all fours, sometimes had to slide on my belly in the pitch black under these great jagged stalactites. And the cave's passages were never more than so wide and so high at the highest. And oftentimes they were about that high. So I was sliding on my belly literally like a snake. And this went on for about a mile. And occasionally the caves were wider. And you'd see the most fantastic um, formations. One formation exactly like a coffin, all ordained with um, wreaths of jasmine and candles offering a sonaga. And the great pillars like um, Roman or Greek pillars. Eventually, after about an hour's trek through these caves, we came to this area where Mr. Pintley said he had seen the manga. And he described how about 10 years earlier he had been um, in a very poor manic time before the third world in Stanley. And he'd gone down exploring in the cave to see if there were any deposits or anything. Like that. So we come eventually to the heart of the caves, this great tubular cave. Very hard to describe, but it's almost, almost circular. And in the darkness, it seemed an immense snake. He said its head was in the shadows of two heads, but the body was 18 meters long. He crouched down and said, he was crouched down this, and the body in its height was almost level with his eyes. Once again, he described something jet black. Jet black. with a green sheen to it, and he throws in terror and battle against the wall of the cave, and watch for half an hour as this thing agonizingly slowly crawl past. My idea is that we had to cross several subterranean rivers to get to here, and I think this thing had come out of the Mekong River, got lost, and crawled around the caves for a while, and found his way back down. And Mr. Pimper says, though, shortly afterwards, he found a strange little stone that seemed like a stone that had placed in a ring, a ring with an argus on it. And from then on, he sort of changed, and it was between some of that, and it became reasonably well off. And eventually, he led us out of the tunnels again, and um, we had to climb a 10 foot shaft back into the sunlight. I was quite impressed with this old man because we didn't give him anything. He wasn't paid to tell his story. And he was quite amazed that someone from the outside would be so interested. But now these caves, and he told me that was less than one tenth of their extent, the caves are into the sacred, holy place now that we are the sea. So we travelled back to Bangkok, and the last thing I did really before um, going back to England, uh, not counting the massage powers, but. <laughs> We look at some film purported to be of the Naga swimming in the Mekong River. And um, it was taken by a man who was the director of Pata Zoo in, uh, in Thailand. And uh, Pata Zoo is a zoo on top of a department store of all places. And we actually visited it and it was a dreadful, terrible place. I'm very, very much in favour of um, responsible zoos that have breeding uh, <coughs> for lots of human species. This place was terrible. You'd have three tigers in a cage half the size of this room, two adult gorillas in a cage half the size of this room, three leopards in a cage, four. Well, that's as far as her gun extends from the wall and back to the wall, three leopards around the room. And some very rare things like pygmy hippopotamus and stuff, all stuffed up the top of this bloody department store. Anyway, we were meant to interview this man, but he'd slipped over, smashed his head open, and was in critical condition. So I think that's karma for the new back. But we saw his film, his supposed film from Nardis swimming in the Mekong River. And uh, I'll be the first to admit that most pieces of film reporting to show the mystery animals are very sort of 
out of focus, wobbly, pixelated, and unconvincing. This was bloody terrible. It's one of the worst I've seen. It was out of focus, pixelated, badly filmed, wow, was being tossed along by the Nikon River, and I said so in no uncertain terms. So the conclusion I came to was that the sightings, the people I've talked to seem to fall into two categories. And there were sort of very mystical, magical ones that had happened in temples and stuff, and seen by monks and other religious people. And there were ones that were in and around the Mekong River, which seemed to describe something real swimming in the Mekong River. So I, what I think has happened in Thailand is that the mythology of the Naga has come down from India into Indochina and has been grafted onto a real animal, a real giant snake-like animal that lives in the Mekong River. What could the animal be? Well, most of the sightings were in the 5 to 18 meter range. Now, 18 meters is about twice the size of the biggest known snake. But it's all aquatic, and they lived in the Pleistocene Epoch, and their fossils have been found all over the world, mainly in the tropics. But in some areas, they lingered up until 10,000 years ago. Now, 10,000 years ago, zoologically um, speaking, is yesterday. It's the blink of an eye. Geologically speaking, the blink of an eye. And my theory is that um, species of black swede, snakes, these gigantic 18 meter plus long snakes, have survived in certain areas of the world. Now in Africa, in the swamps of the Sudan, there are tales of something called the Lao, which is a gigantic snake that's supposed to have a strange horns or tentacles growing on its face. In South America, you have the Manatoro, the killer of bulls, also called Socorro Gigante, the giant boa, an immense giant snake dwarfing the biggest anaconda. Once again, it's supposed to have horns on its head. In Indochina, you have the Naga, once again a giant snake with a crest on its head. So this motif of giant snakes with crests or horns runs all the way around the world. And what I think they are a surviving Matsuyas, genuine survivors of the Black Ice Age who still inhabit <coughs> deep remote rainforests and are occasionally seen and become mythical creatures due to folklore being grafted onto them. And you only have to look at some of the folklore here in England, things like the Lambton Worm, and other giant snakes out of British <coughs> folklore. Um, there are many stories of giant subterranean snakes that in medieval times came out and laid waste to the countryside and told them to find a slave of some era. So, to cap it all off, I think um, Basically, the Naga is a real creature that has, that has had mystical attributes attached to it due to this moulding of Buddhism and Hinduism. Uh, I was only out there a short time making this film from Discovery Channel. Hopefully, I'd like to go back again, but in order to catch one of these things, it would take a hell of a long time, which long time I was out there.